Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Thursday, the 26th of May, 2022. Time for the hurricane outlook and discussion. And as the graphic says there, our title card and YouTube thumbnail, the hurricane season looks to begin busy. The eastern Pacific going to have its first name storm here. Probably going to be a hurricane and it will make uh, landfall, it looks like, eventually in southern Mexico. And then, as the graphic there, we're going to get to it from Ben Knoll. Well, he tweeted that graphic from the JMA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, suggesting that as we get into June, the Atlantic Basin will start off potentially pretty busy. At least the window of opportunity looks like it's going to be there. Right now, nothing expected over the next 48 hours, and the same can be said as well for the next five days. In the eastern Pacific, however, not the same. Uh, we have this area down here, Invest 91E. And just a real quick refresher, what's an invest? These are these areas of suspect weather that get tagged with these invest numbers or low-level investigation numbers or whatever you want to call it. They go 90 through 99, and the E is for Eastern Pacific. L is for Atlantic and so forth and so on, W for West Pacific. And it's just a way to assign more resources, computer models, maybe tasking recon, and just a bunch of other things start happening when they become more than just Oh, look at that blob of clouds over there that we're keeping an eye on. It is a classification system that kind of gets the ball rolling, gets things started as we track tropical entities around the globe. So this one is 91E. Um, I guess we had a 90E at some point. I don't remember. That's okay. But this is 91E. It goes 90 through 99, and then they just start over. I don't know who came up with it exactly. That's just the way it is. So here it is. Uh, south of the Gulf of Tehuantepec, which is right here, and this looks like it's going to really uh, ramp up over the next few days, probably become a hurricane, and I'll show you the evidence why I think that in just a moment. First, though, the uh, animation this afternoon from the Tropical Tidbit site. Uh, you notice over the lower 48, this area of spin, and then some thunderstorm activity down to the south of it. Uh, deep fetch of moisture working its way up out of the Gulf of Mexico, you know, I oftentimes talk about the big western Atlantic ridge pumping the uh, deep tropical moisture from the Gulf into the southern plains. Well, it also sometimes works that you get southwesterly to southerly flow like we're seeing today coming up out of the Gulf and streaming into the southeast United States, United States, not just the southern plains. And as such, we're having some issues in western North Carolina. I saw a tweet from Evan Fisher just a little while ago that uh, parts of western North Carolina, there's just too much rain happening, and we could be looking at some flooding issues up there. Um, and even along the I-10 corridor here in Florida, and then some of the bigger cities of the southeast, from Montgomery to Birmingham, Atlanta, and then uh, eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, with this non-tropical mid-latitude storm right here over Missouri. Meanwhile, there's 91E down in the eastern Pacific. There's a nice anticyclone building over the top of it that acts like an umbrella a big area of high pressure a loft that allows this thing to grow vertically underneath and not get sheared apart by strong upper level winds you notice that those strong upper level winds are on the north side so as long as this stays down here in this cocoon it can go on and develop further over the warm waters of the eastern pacific there south of central america and we can see this reflected very nicely on the vorticity signature We'll zoom in on it over here. That is it right there. We'll circle it in blue, starting to get more round in appearance. A lot of other energy around it. It's going to start to sort of breathe that energy in or absorb that energy and, and consolidate the moisture, the available energy down there, the uh, latent heat from the ocean. You name it, it's going to do it. And this, again, will be our first name storm, Agatha. That'll be the name in the eastern Pacific. And this is what it looks like on the modeling this is the GFS from 12Z today, 850 millibars in the atmosphere. That's the same level, by the way, as this graphic. This graphic is also 850 millibars, and we're looking at vorticity, or spin, in the atmosphere. And this is the model. The other graphic was an analysis. This is what the computer model, quote-unquote, thinks, or is forecasting, or outputting, whatever way you want to look at it, over time. So here's our system. This is 91E right now. This is the model interpretation of it. 
uh, out in the Atlantic. Uh, you got the trades blowing through, not particularly strong right now. You know, they're not like super weak, but they're also not roaring through here at 20 to 30 knots. Somewhat of a high pressure area over the Western Atlantic. And then there's the reflection of our mid to upper level storm system over Missouri. This is what it looks like in the model. That's a satellite imagery. This is the vorticity shot. And then there it is in the model. See how that works? It's pretty neat. So let's put this out into time, 24 hours. So this would be valid Friday morning, tomorrow morning. And there's 91E right there starting to get even better organized in the GFS. And it just keeps going. Uh, by 48 hours, really starting to come together. Saturday morning and then Sunday morning, it really starts to wind up. Might be on its way to becoming a hurricane at this point. And you can see really strong ridging here over the Atlantic these different height lines in the atmosphere. This is the lower part of the atmosphere, 5,000 feet, but still, this is the bottom part of this big old Atlantic Ridge that's acting like a huge mountain of air. That'll keep this system down here uh, so that it can't move due north immediately and cut across into the Bay of Campeche, or Campeche, either, either way. Um, instead, it just kind of mills around until that high pressure area changes and moves a little bit, which it does, plus, it's on the southwest side of it. The influence of this high pressure area is only so far and so wide. And so it feels the weakness there on the western periphery of that big old Atlantic Ridge. So by 96 hours, it starts to approach Mexico. The GFS suggesting uh, just under five days time on the west side of the Gulf of Tehuantepec right over here. As we get closer, uh, particularly tomorrow when I talk about this, we'll zoom in. We'll look at some Google Maps. And uh, once this becomes a named, you know, a depression even, we will look at it on our interactive map. If you haven't seen our interactive map, it's on the Hurricane Track Insider site funded through our Patreon support. Um, you're going to really like this. We can really zoom in, see the track, where the different geographic locations are that could be impacted. And especially for Mexico, that'll help me because it'll have the different place names, some of the more minute details that we can get even down to street level as to where this could be going. So be sure to tune in if it's a depression tomorrow or by Saturday, whenever it becomes a named entity, um, O1E, I guess it would be. That's the first named storm or the first cyclone of the Pacific. I think it'll be O1E. Um, when that happens, we'll be able to track it on our map. So anyway, what happens? Day five, it's on shore there. Uh, the overall signal is interesting. We have this general monsoon trough, a little bit of a gyre going on down here. See the wind shift? That's your trough, your monsoon trough. That's a low pressure area through here. And you got this wind shift that comes around it overall, helping to consolidate energy and moisture. And uh, a lot of that coming in from the Caribbean and the Atlantic, the trades, uh, energy coming off South America. Just a lot of potential down there building up as we get into the first few days of June. All right, so we move this on out to day six, and then finally day seven. That's as far as we're gonna to look today. The GFS trying to take a lot of this energy and do something with it, either in the vicinity of Central America, we see that often, especially early in the season, and another piece of energy up here, uh, northeast of the Bahamas, southwest of Bermuda, which is right there and uh, south of Hatteras, you know, east of Jacksonville, just to give you some references. What's going to happen? Well, the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which is a large scale, very wide area of favorable conditions, seems to be moving across the Pacific and into the Atlantic Basin, uh, Eastern Pacific into the Atlantic over the next several days, couple of weeks or so. Let's take me away and we can see what Ben Knoll is talking about here that I think if I click on it, it'll actually stop the animation. So this is the JMA 200 millibar. So it's way up in the atmosphere. The green basically is favorable. All right, so this is May 27th through June the 3rd, and we can let it play one more frame. And then June 3rd through the 10th, look at this huge area of green over here. Let's outline it in white so it pops better. All this area of favorability in the Atlantic Basin something's going to try to go in that scenario. And the models are going to try to figure it out and interpret it. The Euro, the Canadian, uh, there's so many of them, the GFS, all the ensembles. You're going to see a lot of noise out there. So this is basically what I want you to look at is a window. 
And this is a big window, all right? This is not a little window. We get those smaller convectively coupled Kelvin waves, which are smaller windows of opportunity. That's the easiest way to understand it. This MJO, and notice Ben used the strong arm emoji there, and he doesn't use these things lightly. He uses these as, he uses these as a communication tool, and I think it's very effective. It is a strong pulse. This one's showing up. Ben knows what he is looking at, and he knows what he is looking for. So he understands the signal. That's why we rely on Ben. He produces these nice maps. We can understand them. I can interpret it for you and show you the window is coming, and this is a significant window of opportunity. It doesn't guarantee that we'll get a named storm out of it in the Atlantic side. Part of it is starting to happen with 91E that will eventually become Agatha, and I think it should spill over into the Atlantic, but the details we just don't know yet. So you're going to see a lot of runs of the operational guidance from the GFS to the Euro, and that leads very nicely into this tweet from Andy Hazelton uh, regarding the system potentially in the Southwest Atlantic, thinking uh, he is that there's probably too much shear for much to happen, but early next week, three of the major model systems are all advertising an upper area of difluence, that's air that's spreading out, in the upper levels, that's good for development. East of a trough, troughs usually low pressure and converging air, off the east coast under a ridge trying to spin up a weak low. You know, this is just basically saying, hmm, we need to watch that area in the southwest Atlantic. So again, this is what the uh, GFS was showing at day seven, right there. There it is, just to show you what we were looking at a few minutes ago. There it is in the GFS operational a week out. And then these are the different scenarios. He has screenshotted some of these. That's 150 hours out. The same thing, cyclonic vorticity. There's the energy in the southwest Atlantic. This is June the 1st, first day of hurricane season, officially on the calendar, so why not, right? Uh, ECMWF is closer to Florida and the southeast coast as a whole, but it's got a general same idea, the same kind of look, and the Canadian is just offshore of Daytona in vicinity. So yes, we're going to need to watch this for potential development. The waters in this area are warm enough, generally speaking, especially in the Gulf Stream, which does snake its way through there. So there is some consensus here from the models. It's not just one saying it. We have three here. The operationals, the ensembles, the different signals are picking up on this, that we could see development as that window of opportunity slides into the Atlantic Basin. So we'll watch what Andy says, what Ben says about this, and track the models and so forth, and we'll stay on top of it. All right, moving on to uh, severe weather. That is still very much a concern and a growing concern as we get into next week. For today, however, um, parts of the northwest part of the country, marginal to slight risk, so heed that. Be aware, especially if you're hiking up here, some of those peaks don't want you to get struck by lightning up there if you're the tallest object. And then that southerly flow coming out of the Gulf there, feeding some strong to severe thunderstorm potential in the yellow area here, anywhere from Illinois and Indiana down to the deep south Atlanta uh, to, well, you know, we'll call it uh, Mexico Beach, Panama City, maybe Pensacola, just generally this area of the southeast. You know, keep an eye on it. You've got a lot of interstates that go through there. People might be starting to travel. Tornado threat. Greatest in the green and the brownish color, the wind threat, straight line winds, highest in the yellow areas, and then the hail threat is, interestingly enough, today highest out here in portions of Oregon, sort of that corner area of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, the three corners, we'll call it. Uh, so this is today, Thursday, so Friday, tomorrow, the threat generally shifts for the highest concentration of severe weather to the I-95 corridor, I do suspect. A little bit of a slight will get introduced in here somewhere as more data becomes available through the experts and their, um, you know, how they watch everything at the SPC. Uh, tomorrow we'll see how that pans out. The tornado threat greatest right up the I-95 corridor. A lot of people are going to be traveling, so I want to draw your attention to this. Tell people about this. Seriously, they're going to be driving. And even if you're like, dude, there's only a 5% chance of tornadoes. That's a 95% chance that there won't be give me a break, I'm not worried about it. Well, okay, fine, no tornadoes, let's say, 95% chance you won't see one, but there could still be plenty of severe weather, hail, straight line winds, torrential rains, and you're going 82 miles per hour down the interstate, 
you hit an area of water and it lights out. Seriously, it's a problem. So take the weather seriously. And you know, it's not just the tornadoes, it's the outline of the severe threat and how it can impact you. Be selfish about it in this case. How's it gonna impact me? And then translate that across you know, to other people that you know that might be traveling. Finally, as we get into the weekend, the threat begins to shift to the high plains. And then this is area all through here, the area that we're gonna to need to watch as we go to the day four through eight time frame. Already uh, introducing a 30% chance of significant severe weather on day four. That would be Sunday and then day five, Monday. And this has triggered me to get a plane ticket from Wilmington out here to Denver. That's roughly where Denver is uh, I, uh, for, for this on Monday, Memorial Day. And uh, working with a couple of my colleagues, I will talk more about that tomorrow and Saturday, especially as this gets into the three-day outlook area. We refine it better. But I'm telling you, I've been seeing a few tweets here from a couple of people that know a lot more severe weather stuff than I do. And this has the makings of a pretty nasty setup. Maybe that long track supercell type thing starts to come into play. We'll wait and see. But the potential is there for a pretty high end event um, Sunday, Monday, maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week as conditions favor that in the heart of Tornado Alley, the Great Plains, Southern Plains, up to the High Plains, we need to watch this. And I'll be out there. I'll cover it. And we're going to be doing some interesting things as well, um, just trying to find our place. How do we work Tornado Alley like we have worked hurricanes? Still working on it. Uh, and you can be a part of it. You know, watch it live as we experiment with some stuff. All right. Uh, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And then again, I'm going to keep hammering this because we're going to do it. I can't wait. June 1st even if I happen to still be out there, wherever I am, all I gotta do is pick this guy up, the old iPhone, and I'm gonna cut a 90, 90 minute, oh, please spare us, a 90 second, no, that was not a Freudian slip, a 90 second video uh, outlining what we're gonna look at for that day in the tropical, um, the, the hurricane outlook and discussion. See, I got all flustered thinking 90 minutes, no. Um, it's gonna be called What's Up in the Tropics with Mark Suddeth, a cute little name, that's going to debut across all those platforms on our Patreon, on our Discord as well. We ought to just put eight things on there. Kari would love that. Um, she produces a lot of these graphics for me. But that's coming June 1st. Start your morning off with What's Up in the Tropics with Mark Suddeth. And then later in the day, we'll go over things in detail. No, not 90 minutes on the Hurricane Outlook and discussion. All right? Look at that map right there, that graphic from Ben Knoll. It's coming. I think we're going to have an opportunity of development coming up in the first part of the season. And then it's just going to be waves of it for the next six months. So get ready. We saw this coming, and I think it's about at our doorstep, about to ring the doorbell. All right? Good way to wrap things up today. And look, you know, don't look at it as doom and gloom either. It's, uh, we, we have the science on our side, so be positive about it. We know that this stuff could be coming. Unlike the earthquake, we saw one in Peru today and in uh, California right? South, uh, Southern Cal. I'll take the hurricanes that we can see coming for days away over those earthquakes. Anyway, enough from me. Let's get this online for you. Thanks as always for tuning in. I am Mark Sutter, Hurricane Track. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.